नानाडी गांधी इंजिना बाय बाबा साहेब अंबेडकर नाइन स्ट्रॉन्गली लेबल्ड इज टेन पॉस्टेरिटी इज ऑलवेज इंटरेस्टेड इन द लास्ट वर्ड्स लास्ट रिग्रेट्स ऑफ ग्रेट मैन द लास्ट वर्ड्स ऑफ ग्रेट मैन आर ऑलवेज नॉट सिग्निफिकेंट ऑफ देयर एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ दिस वर्ल्ड और देयर विजन ऑफ द नेक्स्ट For instance, the last thoughts of Socrates were to call Crito and say, "We owe a cock to Asclepius, discharge the debt, and by no means omit it." But their last regrets were always significant and worth producing, pondering over. Take the case of Napoleon. Napoleon, before his death at Saint Helena, showed evidence of being uneasy over three capital points, which constituted his last regrets. They were. that he could not have died at some supreme moment of his career that he left egypt and gave up his eastern ambitions and last but by no means the least his defeat at waterloo had ranade any supreme regrets one thing is certain that ranade if he had any could not have had the same regrets such as those which disturbed the peace of mind of napoleon ranade lived for service and not for glory it mattered very little to him whether the moment of his death was glorious or inglorious or whether he died a hero or a conqueror or a master or whether he died as a common man sometimes does of common cold as a matter of fact ranade was not troubled by any regrets so far as record go ranade does not seem to be conscious of any act or event about which he had any regrets he had a happy and peaceful death but it is worthwhile asking would ranade have any regrets if he came to life today i am sure there is one matter over which he will feel extremely grieved namely the present condition of the liberal party in india what is the present position of the liberal party in india the liberal party is a causality indeed this is a very mild expression the liberals are the contemptibles of indian politics to use the language of norton used in another connection they are disowned by the people unowned by the government having the virtues of neither but possessing the vices of both there was a time when the liberal party was the rival of the congress today the relation of the liberal party to the congress is that of a dog to his master occasionally the dog barks at his master but for the most part of his life he is content to follow him what is the liberal party if not the tail of the congress many are asking why do not the liberals merge in the congress so useless has their existence become how can ranade help not regretting the collapse of the liberal party how can any indian help regretting it the collapse of the liberal party is a tragedy to all liberals but it is really a disaster to the country the existence of a party is so essential to a popular government that it is impossible to conceive the possibility of getting on without it as an eminent american historian says it is easier to imagine the demolition of any part of our constitutional organization the submersion of a large part of what the constitution describes than to imagine our getting on without political combinations they are our vital institutions indeed to attempt to govern a country by the mass of voters without the control and discipline of a party is to use the language of james bryce they contemplating to manage a rail board by the votes of uniform the shareholders or to lay the course of a sailing ship by the votes of the passengers it is undeniable that a party is an essential adjunct to popular government but it equally is undeniable that the rule of a single party is fatal to popular government in fact it is a negation of popular government the case of germany and italy furnished the most cogent evidence of this point instead of taking a warning from the totalitarian states we are taking them as models to copy the one party system is being hailed in this country in the name of national solidarity those who are doing so are failing to take note of the possibilities of tyranny as well as the possibilities of misdirection of public affairs which is inherent in the one party government to have popular government run by a single party is to let democracy become a mere form of despotism to play its part from behind it how under one party government the tyranny of the majority ceases to be an empty phrase and becomes a menacing fact 
has been our experience in India under the Congress regime. Were we not told by Mr. Rajagopalachari that the separation of the executive and the judiciary which was necessary under the British is no longer necessary? Has it not showed the despot's taste for blood? Despotism does not cease to be despotism because it is elective. Nor does despotism become agreeable because the despots belong to our own kindred. To make it subject to election is no guarantee against despotism. The real guarantee against despotism is to confront it with the possibility of its dethronement, of its being laid low, of its being superseded by a rival party. Every government is liable to an error of judgment, great many liable to bad administration, and not a few to corruption, injustice, and acts of oppression and bad faith. No government ought to be free from criticism. But who can criticize a government? Left to individuals, it can never be done. So Toby has left behind advice as to how one should deal with one's enemy. He said, Soon, so soon as ever thou seest him draw and ask thou drawest, swear horrible. But this is not possible for an individual who wants to stand up against the government. There are various things against individuals successfully playing that part. There is, in the first place, what Bryce calls the fatalism of the multitude that tendency to acquiesce and submit due to the sense of insignificance of individual effort, the sense of helplessness arising from the belief that the affairs of men are swayed by large forces whose movements cannot be turned by individual effort. In the second place, there is possibility of the tyranny of the majority which often manifests in suppressing and subjecting to penalties and other social disabilities persons who do not follow the majority of which some of us have good experience during the Congress regime. In the third place, there is the fear of the CID, the Gestapo, and all other instrumentalists which are at the disposal of the government to shadow its critics and to silence. The secret of freedom is courage, and the courage is born in combination of individuals into a party. A party is necessary to run government, but two parties are necessary to keep government from being despotism. A democratic government can remain democratic only if it is worked by two parties, a party in power and a party in opposition. As Jennings puts it, if there is no opposition, there is no democracy. His Majesty's opposition is no idle phrase. His Majesty needs an opposition as well as a government. In the light of these considerations, who could deny that the collapse of the Liberal Party in India is not a major disaster? Without the resuscitation of the Liberal Party or the formation of another party, the fight for freedom will result in loss of freedom for despotism is antithetical of freedom whether the despotism is native or foreign. It is a pity Indians have lost sight of this fact. But I have no doubt that those who are shouting that the Congress is the only party that Congress is this nation will leave to rule their decision. Why has the Liberal Party collapsed? Is there anything or something wrong in the philosophy of Ranade? Is there anything wrong with the men in the Liberal Party? Or is the working of the Liberal Party at fault? I for one hold that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the philosophy of Ranade. Nor can it be said that the, of the two, the Congress is the best cause and the Liberal Party the best men. The Liberal Party is both. To my mind, what has brought about the collapse of the Liberal Party is the complete lack of organization. It may not be without interest to expose the weaknesses in the organization of the Liberal Party. As pointed out by Pendleton Herring in his volume of Politics of Democracy, the organization of a party is spread over three concentric lines. The concentric ring represents the oligarchy in control of the party organization, what is called the high command. There are associated with it its workers who are primarily concerned with securing their livelihood through the party organization, whether as party officials or through public office. They are called professional politicians and constitute the party machine. Surrounding this inner group, the high command and the machine, there is a large circle of persons bound to the party by ties of tradition and emotional loyalty. They think of the principles professed by the party. They are more concerned with its ideals and symbols than with the acts of the professional party workers and leaders. They vote for the party ideal rather than for the party record. 
outside this second ring lies the vast body of people who are not attached to any party. It is a floating population. The reason for their being unattached is either because they are aimless, thoughtless or because they have particular interests which are not included in the platform of any party. Those outside the second ring constitute the most vital field of action for a political party. They are the prize which a party must capture. To capture this prize, it is not enough to enunciate principles and formulate politics. Men are not interested in principles and politics. But they are interested in accomplishing them. What is necessary for a party is to bring about concerned action. For, in the words of President Woodrow Wilson, given self government with a majority rule, things can be accomplished not by individual voice but by concerted action. Now, for concerted action, what is necessary is the crystallization of individual opinions into public opinion. This crystallization or building up of public opinion as a sanction behind a particular principle becomes the main function of a party. Theoretically, a political party are agencies for the expression and execution of public opinion, but in practice, parties create, direct, influence and often control public opinion. Indeed, this is the chief function of a party. For this, a party must do two things. In the first place, it must establish contact with the masses. It must go out among the masses with its wares, its principles, policies, ideas and candidates. In the second place, it must carry on propaganda among the masses in favour of its wares. It must animate them and enlighten them. To quote Bryce again, give the voters some knowledge of the political issues they have to decide, to inform them of their leaders and the crimes of their opponents. These are the basic factors from which concerted action can rise. A party which fails to forge concerted action has no right to call itself a party. Which of these things the Liberal Party has done as an organization? The Liberal Party is only the High Command. It has no machine. Not having any machine, the High Command is only a shadow. Its following is confined to that of the second concentric ring, consisting of persons who are bound by ties of tradition. The leaders have nothing to evoke emotional loyalty. They have no war cry to gather a crowd. The Liberal Party does not believe in mass contact. It would be difficult to imagine a party so completely isolated and insulated from the main mass of people. It does not believe in conversion. Not that it has no gospel to preach, but like the Hindu religion, it is a non proselytizing -pro creed. It believes in the formulation of principles and policies, but it does not work for giving effect to them. Propaganda and concerted action are anathema to the Liberal Party. Individual voices and annual meetings are in clamour for invitation when a crips arrives or when the viceroy decides to invite important individuals has become the limits of his political activity. Is there any wonder if the Liberal Party has fallen into disrepute? The Liberal Party has forgotten the most elementary fact that organization is essential for the accomplishment of any purpose, and particularly in politics, where the harnessing of so many divergent elements in the working unity is so great. Who is responsible for this collapse of the Liberal Party in India? However much we may regret to have to say it, I think it will have to be admitted that the responsibility for this catastrophe does to some extent fall on Ranadi. Ranadi belonged to the classes. He was born and bred among them. He never became a man of the masses. The Liberal Party has no machine and the reason why it did not forge a machine is because it did not believe in mass contact. This aversion to mass contact is the legacy of Ranadi. In avoiding mass contact, the party is following the tradition left by Ranadi. There is another legacy of Ranadi to the Liberal Party and that relates to the false faith in the driving force of principles and policies. Mazzini once said, you may kill men, you cannot kill the great idea. To me, it appears to be a most mistaken view. Men are mortal, so are ideas. It is wrong to hold that an idea will take roots pro prio vigore. An idea needs propagation as much as a plant needs watering. Both will otherwise wither and die. Ranade agreed with Mazzini and did not believe that the fructification of an idea needed the resources of strenuous husbandry. If the Liberal Party is content with mere formulation of principles and policies, 
it is also because of this tradition of Ranade. What is the duty of liberals? All liberals I know will say our duty is to follow the master. What could be the attitude of a devout band of friends, disciples? But can anything be more mistaken or more uncritical? Such an attitude implies two things. It means that a great man works by imposing his maxims on his disciples. It means the disciple should not be wiser than the master. Both these conclusions are wrong. They do injustice to the master. No great man really does his work by crippling his disciple and by forcing on them his maxims or his conclusions. What a great man does is not to impose his maxims on his disciples. What he does is to evoke them, to awaken them to vigorous and various exertion of their facilities. Again, the pupil only takes his guidance from his master. He is not bound to accept his master's conclusions. There is no ingratitude in the disciple not accepting the maxims or the conclusions of his master. But even when he rejects them, he is bound to acknowledge to his master in deep reverence, you awakened me to be myself. For that I thank you. The master is not entitled to less. The disciple is not bound to give more. It is therefore wrong to the master as well as to the, himself for the disciple to bind himself to the maxims and conclusions of his master. His duty is to know the principles and if he is convinced of their value and their worth, to spread them. That is the wish of every master. Jesus wished it, Buddha wished it. I am sure the same must be the wish of Ranade. It follows that if the liberals have faith in and love and respect for Ranade, the supreme duty lies not merely in assembling together to sing his praises, but in organizing themselves for spreading the gospel of Ranade. What hope is there of the liberals coming forward to fulfill this duty? Signs are very depressing. In the last election, the liberals did not even contest the seats. That, of course, is in itself a matter of some surprise. But this pales into nothing when one recalls the announcement made by the Right Honourable Srinima Shastri, the leading light of the Liberal Party, that he wishes the Congress to succeed. There is no parallel to this except in the treacherous and treasonous conduct of Bhishma, who lived on the bounty of the Kauravas, but wished and worked for the success to their enemies, the Pandavas. This shows even the Liberals had lost faith in the Gospel of Ranade. If this is the general condition of health, of the Liberal Party, it is better if the party died. It would clear the way for a new orientation and spare us the tedium of idle clatter of Liberals and Liberalism. For such an event, even Ranade may express satisfaction from his grave. The end.